All right, uh, welcome back, everyone. Um, I hope you, hope you had a good, really short break, and maybe even someone was able to find the snacks, which I hear are downstairs. So sorry if you missed them. Um, so it is my great pleasure uh, to continue on with our workshop and to introduce Thomas Reed. Uh, so Thomas, uh, I first knew of Thomas from social media, all the social medias. Um, uh, but one of the things that he's been doing for a while now is a really great podcast called uh, Read My Mind Radio. Uh, and I encourage you all to check it out. Um, it's a place for uh, sharing stories of blindness, disability. Um, and so uh, I, I hope I hope you'll probably tell us a little bit more about this, but also I hope you all will check that out. So welcome, Thomas. So today I was asked to speak about three main topics. First, uh, the, the idea of AI answering these questions of, uh, from the blind community. So my own experience with that, um, my interest in image descriptions and video descriptions and, and how that can impact AI or how AI might help improve that. Uh, and then third, my experience or my perspective and or my perspective would be my eyes, the app, and the possibility of be my eyes kind of using that data to, to help open AI um, and improve the model. So I'll talk a little bit about that. So I actually have a, a favorite out of all of these. And since I told you I'm really into audio description, I guess it's the second one. So I'll probably spend more time on the second one, and I think that's probably more valuable. So, because my, my experience to date with the first one, in terms of AI, my experience with AI, um, has mainly consisted of what we've been hearing all, all throughout. I mean, is, is the basic interactions with asking a single question of AI, right? Um, because usually my experience is I have something that I need to identify, something in my hand. And I think that makes a pretty big difference, right? Something that I can actually touch and take a picture and just ask it, what the heck is this, right? <laughs> what, what, what is this? What is this something that I need to know about? And usually there's some text associated with it. That's kind of usually been the, the main way that I use uh, AI apps like 
no disrespect, uh, Microsoft saying AI <laughs> so, you know, is a battle on the app, but that kind of has been my choice over the last few years because um, it worked. That's, that's really well, the main thing. But there are, are other scenarios that, that I kind of come across, right? Um, the, so, so one of the things is that that happens with me, uh, I'll give you an actual example. Um, I might have an, an item, and this would be an object that doesn't have any text on it. Uh, so for example, you know, as, as if you can see, I'm a, I'm a bald man, uh, usually by choice. I like to say by choice, but the choice is sort of fading away. <laughs> but um, yeah, so, so for example, I have an electric shaver, right? It has this little adapter, the cartridge that you shave with, right, lined up. And occasionally, you know, the, the shaver is a little old now, so it falls out by itself. And so I might, you know, have to kind of look for it. Um, and so it might fall on the floor, but usually I'll, I'll get down and I'll find it. But one of the things that, that I would love to be able to do is sort of take a picture of it, right? Because sometimes, you know, you need to buy a new adapter. You need to buy a new cartridge. But I don't even remember the name of the actual shaver, the device. It probably says it on there somewhere, but usually, you know, it's kind of hard to read those because it's not uh, really identified. Um, but it would be great to be able to take a picture of this thing and sort of ask questions about it. So not only what is it, I know what it is, but where can I, where did I buy this? Where did I actually get it from? How can I get a new one, right? These sort of things. Where, where, where can I get a new one? So that's sort of a, you know, a little bit of, of my experience there with that or some of the things that I would want. Um, but then I think I, I go beyond the idea of where I actually have the object in my possession. So I think about it as on-screen identification. And so we have, you know, my laptop where, um, you know, if someone, my laptop or my phone, if someone sends me a picture, right, that's a, that's a thing that I want to identify. And I can do some of that. But then I also think about the occasions where I'm, I'm consuming a video, I'm watching a video, and they may mention something. Now, let's just say I'm a I'm a I'm an audio guy, so I like I like gear, I like musical. I'm not a musician necessarily, I tinker, but I musical gear, love it. <laughs> I just I just love it, right? So whether it be a keyboard, whether it be some sort of guitar or or mixing device, right? Um, but maybe that will be on the screen, and I want to. I want to interrogate that screen. I want to know what is that? What, what is that? So it would be amazing because there's no way right now that I know of outside of possibly, you know, if it's on television, if I'm actually sitting down watching the television, actually from, you know, I would have to pause it, take a picture of the screen. And then even then, there's probably many other things that are going on on that screen. But I want to know more about that, that mixing board, for example. Tell me about that. What, what does that look like? Is there a name associated with it? I want to learn more about it. So that's the thing that I think would be amazing for me to have access to that. I'll leave it up to y'all to figure it out. <laughs> how, do you, how do you do that? Um, but again, on-screen sort of recognition when I don't necessarily have it in my control to zoom in on a picture, on an item, but I know the item's on screen somewhere. And I want to figure it out. I want to, I want to know more about that. Um, other things are, are advertisements for me, where an ad might come up, you know, about know, some sort of clothing, maybe. I'm not that much into it, but but maybe maybe it's a clothing item. Um, or it, it could even be within a movie where someone could have something on and they refer to it in the film, like, oh, that shirt is great. Now I want to know more about that shirt, right? What what is that shirt? What does it look like? Go beyond the colors, but what else does it? What what else about that shirt? Where where can I find that shirt? Right, where someone else sighted might be able to kind of scope, go around, and look for it and, and recognize it when they see it. Um, for me, I would like to really be able to inquire about that. But again, it's 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 not necessarily you know it couldn't maybe it's not even in an ad. It could just be within a television show or something like that. But you want to focus in on it and get more information. Um, maybe the sizes, the fabric, what does that come in? All of those, all of those kinds of things. I think a lot about infographics. That's all the, I mean, for the last few years, that's kind of been the trend in taking over and exploring data. And I, I understand 
the, the power of infographics because it's a way to summarize data and just make it more understandable. So that's one of those funky areas to me where, you know, I, I guess you could explain the visuals. You could describe the visuals of an infographic, but that's not, to me, I don't think that's really the purpose. And I don't think that would necessarily convey what the image is trying to convey, right? The whole point of the infographic is that it's, it's really succinct. It really summarizes something. So in this case, I may not want to know that there are, you know, 50 buildings or whatever, two buildings in, in a circle, and then there's an arrow pointing to the right, and then there's something else over here. Because explaining that to me may not necessarily make sense um, without the context. And so it's a it's a way of summarizing that where I I guess I want the lesson, I want the takeaway, I want the summary of what that's supposed to be because that's supposed to enable me to understand it better and be able to kind of, you know, succinctly understand it and maybe even talk about it. So infographics to me are a real, a real challenge. And, and how do you kind of, how do you kind of think about that and move on with that? Um, here's a big one since I have access to you all right now. I'm going to put in my request. <laughs> I'm going to take advantage of this situation. Okay. So Here's a real life, a real world example of something that I think would be fantastic. So I take a, it, it, I live in, in Northeast Pennsylvania and it snows. Uh, so until I move out of Northeast Pennsylvania, where I've been, I get my, my house in the Bahamas or something like that. Um, winter comes around and I know it's supposed to snow tomorrow or overnight. I wake up in the morning and did it snow? I have no idea, right? Um, the, the way I would know if it's snowed is if I hear a plow coming down the street. Okay, it definitely snowed, and it snowed a significant amount because the plow was coming down the street, it was clearing the street. Other than that, I don't know. But even then, I still don't know how much, how much it actually snowed. What would be fantastic for me, um, less now, but uh, what would be fantastic to know is how much did it snow? And so sort of breaking these down into smaller components. Did it snow? How much did it snow? Do I need to go and shovel? Because if it's not more than a half an inch, an inch, I'm not going to shovel, right? So, so I want to just know. I want to be able to take a picture or ask some sort of device or have my funky glasses on that can just kind of look out and say, you need to go shovel, right? As opposed to my wife saying, you need to go shovel. Or now she says, I'm going to go shovel because whatever. <laughs> so, so that's kind of that additional information that I would love to be able to have access to. Um, if we go a step further, give me a robot that would just know it's shovel. I know it's time to go shovel and clear it up by itself. That would be fantastic too. But it's, it's some of those, you know, that additional interrogation of the data is kind of what I'm calling. So if the amount of snow is greater than an inch, time to go shovel. Um, Identifying people is a real big thing to me. I considered getting something like that, that uh, what is the security package, the ring? Is that the, the name of that, the security package? Where, where the cameras are set up. Um, and I think the advantage of that is because wherever you are in your house, um, someone rings your doorbell and you can kind of look on your phone and see who it is. Would, would that translate into, okay, hey, it's whatever, your neighbor. It's Chuck, your neighbor. I said, okay, I'm not going to go answer that. <laughs> you know, so, something like that, right, would be fantastic. Um, that's sort of a, a, a next step, not so much object recognition, right, but, but person recognition. And would it be able to identify someone from the camera? Those types of things are really, really interest, interesting to me. Um, the, so that, that's some of the AI stuff that, that in terms of recognition that, uh, that, that I think about. Um, again, the, the big thing for me, and we can talk about that now, is audio description. And so I don't know if anyone is, is unfamiliar with audio description, but audio description basically um, is the, the art of describing in a, in a movie or, or any sort of visual content. It could be a live Broadway play. It could be a sports activity, whatever the case is describing what's taking place 
either on screen or on field or on stage, where there's no dialogue that would be able to make a, uh, enable a person to non-visually understand what's taking place, right? So you think about watching the movie, how many times are there scenes, whether it be an action movie, whatever it is, where it's silent, but there's something taking place. There's something really important happening that you need to know about in order to, to uh, sort of stay involved with this film. So audio description is that. And so there's a separate track that runs with it where they, they actually watch the movie and they describe these things that are that are relevant you know, for someone to understand. So as I'm actually an audio description narrator, and I'm very big on the idea of blind people being involved in the production. And so I, I was asked to kind of put a title on this. And my title for this, everything I'm talking about today, all falls under the umbrella of when AI is about access and independence. Because for me, I get the technology, I love the technology, but for me, it's what does that technology do for me, for the community? And I think my goal um, and my hope is that it would provide more access and independence. And that those, that last one is very sort of it's, it's different for everyone. Independence means something different for me. You can ask uh, someone who's considerably older than me, what does independence mean for them? And it might just be, I just want to walk out and get my mail. And that's fine. That's perfectly fine. You ask someone who's younger than me, oh, I want to do that, I'll do that, 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 that whatever. So, so independence is very different. But again, to me, that that's the goal. So for audio description, um, you know, blind folks have the right and, and the ability to participate in the creation of audio description. Uh, so myself, I'm a narrator. And so the way that I do that, I, I, I have access to be able to read a script, record a script. I have access to all the things I need to do to edit because most of that stuff now is accessible. Um, many of these digital audio workstations and all of that. But there's two other, two other places that probably are more challenging. Um, one is quality control. And so that's a person who kind of runs through the script. Um, and that's accessible, right? To kind of just determine, okay, does this language really convey what's happening? What do you, what do you take away from that? So as a blind person, I can read a script and tell you, okay, I think I'm going to have more questions about this because this doesn't, this doesn't even give me an image. So, so, you know, I think I need more detail. But then there's also a part of that where quality control, just like it sounds, uh, maybe there's a reference to you know, the woman has on red high heels. And it's like, those are not red. So that's a mistake, right? So a quality control person would need to identify that. Um, so that's something that AI could work with, right? Could help and say, hey, wait, what are the color of those shoes when you start to interrogate a scene? Um, so I think there's, there's some possibility that would be fantastic because again, what that would do is to enable a blind person to independently participate in this process of audio description production or other processes as well. One that's more controversial, um, but is happening, is that there are definitely blind folks who write audio description. Now, if I was in some other audience, it would probably go, whoa, but y'all are cool. Y'all get it, right? Because you understand that there's accommodations. Technology is an accommodation. And so the, the question that folks have, well, well how can a blind person write audio description? The art of writing audio description, the art of writing isn't necessarily about seeing, right? If we just take the writing part, it's, it's the crafting, it's the, the wordsmithing, quote unquote, right? It's, it's generating concise sentences that convey a message. And so the, the method that folks who are writing audio description and are blind, what they use is, well, they, they have their own way of accommodating. And some of them use um, an application like Ira. Um, and Ira has an agent on the other side of that app who can describe, not necessarily using the language that the person is going to use to write because they're gonna make it more succinct and make it fit into a small amount of time, but they may get a first sort of a first line understanding of what's happening on that screen. And so now they make note of that. And now they know how to make that into a sentence that fits into that team, right? So Ira could be someone. For someone else, it might be, hey, to a friend, they, they're talking to a friend, hey, come over, 
I'm going to buy some pizza and a beer. We're going to watch this movie. You're going to tell me what's happening. But, you know, chances are, depending on how much beer they drink, it might not be the best description. <laughs> so, but, you know, again, the writer, the blind writer is going to, to take that information and craft it into something. So again, thinking about access and independence, that to me is an area well, and I know there are, there are some, there's some work I believe that's being done around with AI. There's a lot of work that's being done around AI and, and providing audio description. Um, but to me, the, the thing that would be great about that is if it makes space for someone who is interested in, in really tailoring that and really putting, keeping the human factor in the production. Uh, because, you know, I like to think about it that, you know, who, who else, who, who's better when you really think about it, about knowing what a blind person needs to know about this film once they know about it than a blind person? Because they know the information, they know how, how it's going to form that image. What, what, would, what would make you see that in your mind? Um, to me, sometimes we get into conversations about a movie and I'll always kind of go back and say, well, when did this movie come out? And what I'm looking for is the date of that movie because I'm going to compare that to the date of when I lost my sight. And there's many times when I'm like, oh, wait, this is after 2004. So my image, my ability to recall an image of this film is solely, solely based on audio description. That's when I know that's a fantastic audio description because that image is still in my mind. And it was only because of the AD that made that possible. So, so again, um, very strongly, I very strongly think that that you know the the ability for blind people to participate and not only have access but participate in the way that they see fit is it's just a great part of what technology can do, and I want to see that continue um, with AI. In terms of be my eyes. In terms of the app, I haven't used the app all that much. And to be honest with you, um, and this is no nothing against Be My Eyes. So I just want to make sure that, that I'm saying that. nothing against that. Um, that's probably for for a few years when I started to use Be My Eyes, I was kind of like, well, no one's answering. <laughs> it was, it, you know, it was like a million. I don't know how many they're up to right now, but it was said that there was a million volunteers, and it's like, where are they when I'm opening the app? Because it was just Kind of ring and no one would I wouldn't get a volunteer I was going to take it personally just kidding but um but I, I actually it did work for me it did work for me a couple of times uh, in a hotel and I wanted to get something from a uh, a vending machine and so that was kind of nice I held the camera up and it told me that what I was looking for wasn't in the vending machine so, okay but that's not be my eyes for it. but I was asked to kind of talk about my my opinion on how what I thought about Be My Eyes sharing some of that information to assist the AI. And I was like, I, I thought that that was just done. So my, my interpretation of what's happening and what's been happening is that this is sort of the agreement between developers software developers and the blind community is that we're giving you access to this because it's going to help you. Um, but as we all know, I mean, it's, you know, it's going to help everyone. So we were the best test case is sort of how I was thinking. And, and again, this is no judgment at all. This is no judgment. Um, so the idea that Be My Eyes would share that information to improve the AI that was just what everybody thought. Um, that that to me seems it seems logical, right? Seems logical. However, I guess when I think about the bigger picture with AI and and the blind community, is will there be space for the community to participate? Because the AI we all know is going to be if it's not already a Billion seems pretty low at this point, right? Everyone's talking about Chat GPT and how much staff we're going to get and, and all that. Um, 
but I just wonder about the space for for blind people in in the production of AI, whether it be a coder, um, just all all the the various points that there are going to be opportunities for people there. Um, AI and and well, be my eyes and then AI. In addition to that, I think about uh, wow, that just that just went out of my mind. <laughs> That's funny. AI and be my eyes again. The the blind community is sort of participating. The blind community is participating in that in the production. Um, not only the teaching, but in the creation of it. Uh, and I think it goes beyond, it really does go beyond just the, the coders. And I think there's subsets, right? There are subsets to the to the industry. There are supporting things. I just think there's there's just a lot of opportunities. And I think it also goes into beyond the beyond that, it's just society. Because I think, you know, and this again, this is just my opinion. I was asked, so I'm gonna share. Um, I think there's a bigger picture that goes beyond sort of the technology. And the technology is fantastic. I love it. It gives us access. But what the technology does not do, and, and I don't necessarily think it's the place of technology to do this. I mean, let me make that, let me make that clear, is, is changing society's views about disability. And I think that's a really big portion of what needs to, to happen in order for real change. To take place because what we've been told, and I think what is true, is that the technology can sort of quote unquote level the playing field. Um, in theory, I think that's true. But I think the the part that's missing is the change in attitude around disability that that causes still a blind community to have a 50 to 75 percent unemployment rate. But we have the technology that would accommodate people, even like I was talking about with audio description. Um, it's clear that it can be done, but what hasn't caught up is the belief in the abilities of people with disabilities. And unfortunately, technology doesn't necessarily seem to doesn't necessarily make that clear. And so, where AI can end up doing things for people, which is fantastic, that's great. But would it do that? Would it help change the attitude about blindness? Would it help change the attitude about disability? And, and I'm not necessarily saying that it's, it's your place as developers, um, but I am putting it out there as food for thought because I think that's a big part of at some point as as humans that it would be great to kind of figure out right how can this help do that um i don't know i don't necessarily know the answer especially as it applies to ai or technology in general um but it, it's a part that i would love to see because you know if, if it were true again i think that that unemployment rate among people with disabilities would have would have decreased and unfortunately, it doesn't look like that's happening just yet. But yet, we still have way more technology than we've ever had. Um, so I'll just put that out there for y'all. Hope that wasn't depressing <laughs> or anything like that. But it's just the reality, and I want to share that with y'all. So um, yeah. So I don't know if we had questions. If there's anything that I can do to answer any questions, or, or if there's anything that anyone else might want. But I was asked to keep it to about twenty minutes. So okay. Great. Well, first, thank you. We have a quick question or two for Thomas. Come up to the mic. Hi, hey, Thomas. So, thank you for the talk. It was, it was really awesome to hear all that. Um, to add a question about your last point about um, trying to change like the narrative of society about um, people with disabilities and you know employment rates and all that. Um, is there anything that you think developers are doing that turns that progress? Um, while I would like to think of a play solution, but how we could change that rhetoric. And I'd also like to be aware of anything you think that developers are doing to hinder it as well. Yeah, great question. Um, so I'm going to expand it because the first thing that came to my mind is not, not necessarily around people with disabilities, 
Um, but I, I'll, I'll put it like this. So there's a there's a podcast that I listen to, and this was interesting. Um, and I won't name the podcast app, but in the app, the image, the image was interpreted as follows. So the podcast is um, Quest Love Supreme. So if you know Quest Love, the drummer from the Roots, um, if you know him, he has a pretty big afro. <laughs> and so the the image said a man with a helmet. Why? So I went to someone and I said, does Questlove have a helmet on? And they're like, no, this is Afro. This is a, a picture of him. I said, wow, an interpreter has a helmet. Um, so yeah, I think, so So when we talk about different cultures and, and recognizing that, and I think what technology can do is to make sure that, you know, our, our models are including people, you know, folks like to use the word diversity. I just like to say humans, that we have all human beings in there. From, from all different ethnic groups, from all different cultures. Disability is one of those as well. So recognizing, you know, disability devices, whether they be canes, whether they, you know, wheelchairs, whatever the case may be, I think there's an opportunity for a technologist um, to, to do that. That would be very helpful because, you know, we are going to be part of those images that are, uh, that are taken. And we being the big we, the human we. So let's include all humans. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have a question from Zoom. So Donna Garari, who is the head of this workshop, asks, how do you decide whether to trust the visual assistance technology? Ooh, nice question. Trust is, a, I've been thinking about a thing because, you know, we, trust is a big part of, of, of being blind. Um, I'm trusting audio description, I'm trusting whoever wrote the description. And yes, I'm absolutely trusting the, the, the technology. Um, I, I think when, similar to the story that I just said about the helmet, you know, when something sounds off right now, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna look for a human that I trust. Um, and so that's gonna be my wife, my daughter, so someone in my household, if that's where I am, um, to inquire a little bit further. I think, you know, you have to have, usually there's some sort of, you know, I'm, 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 I have some information. I can figure out something, right? Um, I can contextualize what's, what's happening and therefore think about it from that end and then interrogate further. But yeah, there, my immediate thing is to, to trust the technology. Um, but I mean, come on, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm grown. <laughs> I can figure certain things out and, and ask questions about it. Like, I'm not going to be that. I think there was some years ago when folks were like, oh, there was a, a map that took somebody off a cliff. Like, come on, like, you know, if you're driving and you see the cliff coming, are you going to stop? Like, you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, yeah, I, I think my default is to trust it at first, but, but contextualize and ask questions when necessary. I hope that answered that. Uh, yeah, I think it's, it's, more, um, it's really good to hear you talk about all your descriptions. So we've been working on that for the past uh, eight months or so. So we're getting here on uh, maps being uh, the researchers are offered, and we've been training models to generate all your descriptions for movies. Um, but I was kind of interested in what you said about acoustic technology. So these models tend to have issues with hallucination and errors that, if you do everything fully automatic, uh, these could kind of put into production, which wouldn't be ideal. So I'm wondering if someone who works in audio description, how can we help with a semi-automatic method? Would it be putting gaps in the dialogue? Uh, would it be uh, identifying the character in the scene? Um, or like, yeah, do you have any ideas about that? So kind of how can we do a uh, human in the loop to make sure the, the generations are accurate and, to, and things like that? Yeah, no, um, that's fantastic to hear about. Um, the, I think you mentioned character recognition. That's a, that's a big thing because often, and again, contextualizing, sometimes you, we, I can be watching, uh, a film and it would be referred to John and I'm like, wait, John, that doesn't make sense that John would be there. And then I find out, or if I'm watching it with someone, you know, some family member who cited, they might, that's not John, that's Bill, you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. so, so some of that could probably be done with AI. But again, I'm thinking about it from the production side of the AI. So like I was mentioning where the quality control should have picked that up. That should never make it into a final 
into a final version, whether that be because AI was the only thing that was used and so someone just trusted it and just let it go. Um, I don't, I think we all would agree that it's not there, mm -hmm. but again, taking out that human element is, I don't know, that's not my end game. That's not my end game. So being able, so again, I'm coming at it specifically from the perspective of blind people doing that work, because that, I, I want to see more of that. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking that interaction between the user of that technology and the technology itself is really important. Being able to ask those questions and being able to, so again, figuring out some of the, some of the additional information maybe about the difference between John and Bill, right? The difference between the characters for, for someone to be able to understand those differences. What, what is that? What makes John different from Bill? Like does one have blonde hair? One has, you know, one is black, one is whatever, what, whatever the difference is. Um, and again, being able to interrogate that, uh, being, being able to interrogate the software. But again, it's just, uh, you know, I, I know that that ability, I think that's probably easy, right? The ability to say, okay, where is there no dialogue? That seems like it's pretty easy. Am I correct? Yeah, we, we, we can do that pretty well. And um, chance about the dialogue uh, is more just sometimes the fine grain visual understanding is that we so someone might put a necklace in the pocket of someone and the model will say, pull the necklace from the pocket. Um, we, we were actually having a post trauma and we were like, okay, sort of talking to some of the work. But yeah, essentially, some of the fine grain stuff is not there. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether that might be solved in a couple of years. I mean, the plus side of all your description is. There's so much data out there because of the legal requirements. Uh, like we have this audio role now, so I did it. <laughs> yeah. like, You're not supposed to talk about this. <laughs> but okay, yeah, um, but there's a lot of data, so I think there's a chance to improve these models a lot. And um, we just have issues with movie copyright essentially. Uh, in, in the UK, not really like this for accessibility reasons. You can you, you, you can download the stuff, but getting actual movie frames to train models is I think a big challenge to these movie TV show research areas uh, for us. Um, but yeah, it's hard to say, maybe this stuff will improve in the next couple of years if we get good enough, um, but definitely a human loop of even the next five years probably with character technology. Uh, okay. Yeah, again, I mean, my, my main takeaway is just keeping, keeping you and being centered in that process. And, and again, thinking about it from a blind person's perspective, mm -hmm. um, you know, a, a big part of a big part of our involvement is what I was saying is that the the idea for someone to be able to say yes, you can, um, and that seems to be the toughest thing to really to really challenge because some of the audio description written by blind folks today has been fantastic, mm -hmm. it's been fantastic, but you know, we're not really going to experience that because the gatekeepers um, unfortunately don't believe it. So if you can keep that in mind as you're developing, I think we could. We could do something, there. and and the end result is that it's going to be better for everybody, right? If you if you're coding, if you're making this accessible and making it work for a blind person to be able to write audio description, that, that's going to be a fantastic software. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So I think for time, uh, we'll we'll need to move on. But keep in mind, we have a Q&A session uh, with Thomas and the two other keynote speakers in about 10 or 15 minutes. So if you have further questions, you can kind of ruminate on them and we can, we can ask them then. Cool. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you again.